Okay, we're recording. So uh, last time um, we uh, <clears throat> finished sections 5.2 and 5.3. Remember, 5.3 was super quick. Um, okay, so moving on to 5.4, triple integrals. Um, triple integrals are a lot like double integrals. That's one of the most important things to realize about them. Uh, uh, three-dimensional instead of two. Uh, when we get around to the iterated integrals, there's going to be three single variable integrals nested instead of two. Uh, it concerns uh, applications where the accumulating quantity is adding up over a three-dimensional region instead of a two-dimensional region. But, I mean, there are these obvious, you know, dimensional differences. But other than that, the ideas are really, really very similar. So, uh, uh, for example... Uh, suppose you want to uh, compute how much mass there is, uh, keeping in mind mass is an accumulating quantity, the whole is the sum of the parts, right? But what if that mass is not distributed over an area, thus, you know, being appropriate for a double integral? What if it's distributed over a three-dimensional region? So uh, the, uh, <coughs> the density, then, is not going to be mass per unit area. It's going to be mass per unit volume. It'll be a function of three variables because you need to know location in a three-dimensional solid. So some obvious differences. Um, and so how do we deal with this? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through most of the details on how to, you know, what's the definition of a triple integral and how does that relate to an iterated integral. But again, it's so similar to stuff we did before. Um, I think a lot of it you're going to kind of see coming and uh, we've already in some sense <coughs> kind of covered the, the big ideas there. So um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try to spend as little time as possible talking about the, the setup and to leave as much time as possible for the geometry of triple integrals. And the geometry of triple integrals is it's unavoidably three-dimensional. There's just no way around that. Three-dimensional is hard because we are ourselves merely three-dimensional and our paper is less than three-dimensional and this is hard, right? Dealing with three-dimensional pictures and three-dimensional stuff. Okay, so all that said, let's dive in. Um, <clears throat> here now is a three-dimensional domain uh, over which we might want to add up a bunch of stuff. Now, reminder, uh, what it is that we are adding up over this three-dimensional solid isn't really the point of this construction. Don't think of this as we're computing a specific quantity. Think of this as there's lots of different quantities that might be distributed over this rectangular box and that I might want to chop up into little pieces and declare the whole to be the sum of the parts. So um, now I, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, a Riemann sum, something like this, and, you know, in the abstract, I do personally think about a particular application just because it's relatable and visceral, and that is the mass application. Because again, you know, I know what mass looks like and what it feels like, right? But we are not, uh, you know, pigeonholing ourselves into only being able to talk about mass. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we're going to take this domain and chop it up into little pieces. Um, for example, here's one. There's a little piece. And in order to get that piece, um, obviously, I would have to uh, slice up the uh, x-axis. We've already done that. You all know the formulas for how to slice up an interval on the x-axis. We'll also need to slice up the y-axis, the appropriate portion of the y-axis. And again, you all already know those formulas. We use the exact same formulas for double integrals. So none of that's new. The only thing that's new here is I'm also going to have to slice up in the z direction. So I'll be uh, slicing like this, uh, slicing up this interval from E to F. And I'm doing so in morally the exact same way, right? So I'm taking the interval dividing by N. That gives me my delta z. And uh, step sizes of delta z uh, give me these zk. So all that's totally analogous to what we saw in double integrals, which itself is totally analogous to what y'all saw with single variable integrals. Um, okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> with that set up, uh, I'm going to write down the following expression. Let's see, I'll just do it like this. Um, yeah, about like that. 
uh, the following expression down here. And <clears throat> what is the strategy? What does this represent? What, uh, what's going on inside of this picture that motivates this expression? Well, we are going to be looking at one piece at a time. On that one little piece, I'm going to be multiplying some sort of quantity per unit volume times volume. Now, in the mass application that I like to just, you know, for visualization, just to make me feel comfortable about what I'm doing, right? I'm thinking about mass up here. Then this would be mass per unit volume times volume. But if this is a uh, fish tank and I'm not interested in mass, I'm interested in uh, the, uh, the total amount of, uh, I don't know, bacteria growing in the water of the fish tank, right? Then this would be bacteria per unit volume times volume. So whatever your accumulating quantity is per unit volume times volume. So that's how we address that one piece. And then, yeah, I'm going to want to add up over all of these little pieces, the entire three-dimensional box, uh, which means I'm going to have I running from one to N, indicating movement along the x-axis, J along the y-axis, and now K indicating moving along the z-axis. And I'll have, you'll notice down here, three indices then going from one to N. <clears throat> and then you take a limit for round off error reasons, right? Just like every other interval we've ever defined. And bam, we have ourselves an expression. And again, really all this is saying is that the whole is the sum <coughs> of the parts. And that on the parts, stuff per unit size times size. It's like I say, it's just like double integrals, just three dimensional. Okay, pause. Who's got a question? Does this all seem reasonable? Okay. All right. Uh, this is going to be a really important expression. It deserves a name and a notation. The name is triple integral. Um, <clears throat> in recognition of the fact that notation is kind of clunky uh, and unwieldy, I'm also going to shorthand abbreviate this by this notation, three little integral symbols to indicate that we are doing a Riemann sum adding in three different directions because it is a three-dimensional picture. Um, dv over here on the right because, of course, all this size stuff that we have on the right is, in fact, really just representing volume. So, seems like a reasonable notation. Okay. Importantly, though, please do recall, that's just a shorthand, a triple integral. Really, when you think triple integral, you should be thinking this expression, that we're breaking it up into little sub boxes, on each of which we have stuff per unit size, stuff per unit volume, times volume, and then adding up. Okay. All right, so again, the book spends a bunch of time talking about irregular partitions and test points, and that's all very important if you're taking a course in real analysis, which this is not, and I don't really feel like this is the purpose of this course. Uh, so uh, y'all are, again, absolved. You have no responsibility for, uh, for any of that stuff. Okay. All right, so let's do an example real quick. Um, we've already kind of talked through this example. But just to get it all written down, uh, if I want to use a triple integral, namely one of these big, clunky Riemann sums, using this very convenient shorthand notation, uh, the way I address the question of mass is first to note that the whole is the sum of the parts. That's all this says. Integral shorthand notation. It's actually a Riemann sum. So this just says the whole is the sum of the parts. And then uh, secondly, I acknowledge that on each little piece, the amount of mass on each little piece is mass per unit volume times volume. So shorthand, uh, <clears throat> quick and convenient representation of uh, what we already discussed and we already knew was going to work out, that mass is computed with a triple integral. All right, now let's talk about how to visualize 
uh, triple integrals. And uh, there's uh, some uh, nasty little points here. Uh, I'm going to start by recognizing uh, these pictures. Uh, that uh, we sometimes use to understand single variable integrals and double integrals. Um, so area under a graph for a single variable integral, volume under a graph surface for a double integral. And um, sure, that works, I guess, it's fine. But uh, again, you know, I feel it necessary to point out these are relied, along, relied upon way too much. Um, very often students uh, sort of cling to these points of view and are therefore correspondingly uncomfortable with other points of view. Um, in practical applications in the real world, to be honest, it's really not very common that we want to know area under a curve. Sometimes that might be a nice tool for visualizing what we want, but it is rare that this is the end product I have a weird shaped wall and I want to paint it and I need to know how much surface area is on that wall. It just doesn't happen very often, right? So um, <clears throat> sort of an odd picture if you really think about it, given how unrelatable it is and how not that useful it is. Um, so likewise down here, uh, so it's not that common. I may be a little, maybe a little more common that we want to know volume, right? But uh, still usually not what we're interested in. Most of the time, when we're doing these integrals, we're interested in these pictures. If I'm writing down a single variable integral, most of the time it's because I want to add something up over a one-dimensional interval. So the mass of a rod uh, example, or to, you know, slightly more general, mass distributed across a one-dimensional interval. Um, that's really kind of more like it. That's mm, more often sort of uh, representative of the picture of what I'm actually interested in. It's a one-dimensional integral, and it addresses a <coughs> one-dimensional question, which I represent with a one-dimensional picture. It kind of fits, but more natural. And likewise, double integrals, two-dimensional problem, Two to a quantity distributed over a two-dimensional region, two-dimensional picture. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> some other observations I want to make about what's bad about these pictures on the left. When we jump up to a three-dimensional situation, and again, thinking about these graph pictures, one-dimensional integral, one-dimensional picture. Sorry, two, uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, Two-dimensional picture. Uh, Two-dimensional integral, three-dimensional picture. You see the pattern, of course. So for a triple integral, as we just defined, you would expect to have to make a four-dimensional picture if you want to follow this pattern. And that's not something we can do. <clears throat> I, I, uh, at best, we can fool ourselves into believing that we kind of visualize it, but not really, right? So that's a problem. This is a legitimate problem. I mean, if you want to have some uh, geometric sense for what is a triple integral and how should I visualize it, these pictures, in addition to being not that useful, uh, kind of misleading about the fundamental dimension of what we're computing. Third complaint now, they set you up for failure for understanding triple integrals. That makes sense. Let me see this is bad. So um, whereas, by contrast, if I think about uh, these pictures over here, and again, my favorite example is just mass because it's relatable and uh, uh, pretty simple. One dimensional integral can be understood as modeling a problem that takes place on a one dimensional domain. Two-dimensional integral, two-dimensional domain. So how do I understand triple integrals? No problem. Three-dimensional picture. Representing a three-dimensional problem of quantity distributed over a three-dimensional domain. And it's just very natural. And now I will confess three-dimensional pictures are you know, they're a little hard to draw, right? But they're definitely not as hard as four-dimensional. So again, still a win. Yes? Like, okay, 
So when you're like writing the integral like that, where it's like the double integral and then the letters, mm -hmm. is that just mm -hmm. representative of like? Oh, of what the domain is. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, it, let me uh, clear off the mess here. So you're asking about this letter right there? Yeah. Yeah, that's just uh, how we indicate what the domain is for our integral, uh, the, uh, the set over which I'm computing whatever it is. So in this picture over here, it would be this set uh, right there. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah. Yes. When you write the Riemann sum, when you write like um, mm -hmm. x comma y comma z, yeah. One to end. They're not all incrementing together. Like they Correct. That, that's right. They all go independently. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that's why you have, so for a single variable integral, there's n terms. For a double integral, there are n squared terms. Because for each of the values of i, there are n values of so j. It's like a triple uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, that's right. It's a <clears throat> three index yeah. Riemann sum. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. So, uh, yeah, one last comment I want to make um, just for sort of, uh, you know, momentum reasons. Uh, even though some students might recognize that, uh, okay, you know, I see the problem now with, you know, this point of view and this point of view, but they've been doing it for so long, right? They just can't get out of their head that this is how they want to visualize single variable integrals. And for several weeks now, this is how we've been visualizing double integrals. How some students have been visualizing double integrals. Um, and then when they encounter this situation that uh, they can't proceed, then they visualize triple integrals this way. And here's the problem again. The students are now using morally equivalent pictures, right? Three-dimensional pictures sometimes to represent two-dimensional integrals, sometimes to represent three-dimensional integrals. That's confusing. Very confusing, right? So um, try not to fall into that trap. Uh, if you do, if you do find yourself wondering, wait a minute, how come three-dimensional pictures, sometimes it's a double integral, sometimes it's a triple integral, try to uh, force yourself to reinterpret single variable <coughs> integrals with a one-dimensional <coughs> picture, double integrals with a two-dimensional picture, and then you'll have no trouble extending uh, to viewing triple integrals with a three Okay, so yet another reason why uh, I'm uh, relatively cool on the idea of graphs, right? It, it, uh, it's a problem in this, in this context. Okay. <clears throat> okay, moving along. Um, Y'all will recognize this diagram here. This looks a lot like the uh, two-dimensional, uh, well, the, the strategic diagram that we made for double integrals. Right? And we had argued that uh, you can view applications with previously double integrals and now triple integrals. Any application, as long as the quantity is an accumulating quantity, the whole is the sum of the parts, and that's all a Riemann sum says. Any accumulating quantity, the whole is the sum of the parts. Uh, you'll also probably believe me if I told you that we would eventually be writing down iterated integrals and that it's still just single variable calculus. An iterated integral is, after all, just a single variable integral of a single variable integral of a single variable integral. So that you can just crank those out, and that's no problem. The sticky part is how to connect these. And uh, you know, we now have to ask ourselves, is it the case that a triple integral that I unavoidably have to write down in order to connect to applications. Can I then subsequently rewrite it as an iterated interval for computational purposes? Right? And uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the bad news is I can't give you the argument <laughs> analogous to what we did with double integrals because uh, we don't know how to talk about the four-dimensional quantity that, uh, that uh, would be analogous to the the volume uh, that we use as a tool for understanding double integrals. So I can't talk about that. I can't make this connection. I can't make that connection. I can't therefore confirm that this is true. Uh, but let me just say there are other ways to make this connection that involve, nah, I'm going to say, mathematical formalities as opposed to you know pictures. And they're less intuitively satisfying, I think. Um, 
which is why I don't really want to talk about them. There's some, there's some delicate subtleties uh, involved there. And again, not really what we're here for. So I'm just going to assert that those are uh, equal and that it's fine, and I hope you'll be willing to take my word on that. Um, and uh, thus giving us our diagram and our usual three-step process. First, relate your application to a tri triple integral. Second, turn, rewrite your triple as an iterated. And then third, plug and chug. Okay, so that'll be our strategy. Are we all good? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so having noted that, uh, this is that theorem. Triple integrals can be rewritten as iterated. You might call it triple iterated integrals. All right. So, moving along. Um, let's, uh, let's do one real quick. Uh, the question is compute mass. Uh, so step one in the problem, the whole is the sum of the parts. And we uh, already talked through this. This is an accumulating quantity. Whole is the sum of the parts. Mass per unit volume times volume and all of that business. And we ended up with a triple integral. This was the sort of result of the previous example. Uh, second part of the problem is to rewrite that as an iterated integral. Uh, rewriting as an iterated integral is really just a matter of recopying the integrand. I didn't really do anything there. The integrand's the same. Right? Um, and then keeping track of, well, what are the ranges of values of my three different variables? So, well, here's my domain. My domain is this three-dimensional box. Uh, you could probably guess what this notation means. This interval here is the range of values for x. This is the range of values for y. That's the range of values for z. And so if I want to know what are the bounds on the y integral, well, this is the range of values for y over my domain. And so that gives me my bounds for the y integral. And then uh, likewise, proceeding along, if, if I do the x integral next, OK, well, then th there's the range of values for x. So that's my x bounds. And likewise, the z bounds come from the z range, which is that. Everybody good? Yeah? Um, what determines the order of the iterated integrals? Uh, your personal preference. Uh, you have six different ways that you can order the three differentials. And uh, sometimes there are good reasons to want to do it one way versus another. Um, here, when you have a rectangular box, it rarely matters, right? So I just picked this out of a hat. Didn't matter, right? Um, we will find, just like with double integrals, uh, yeah, sometimes it, you want to avoid the corners. You want to, you don't want to have to invert some function if you don't have to. There's going to be motive. We'll see that in examples to come. Uh, but for the moment, take your pick. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and everything else, again, is pretty much the same. Uh, just uh, I, I do like the little cheat, uh, the little life hack of when you're working on one of the integrals, whichever variable is the variable that you'll be plugging the bound values in for, don't forget to put this little reminder in there for yourself. Otherwise, all too easy to take these values 0 and 1, and maybe inadvertently actually plug them in for x and y also. It's easy to mess that up, and you don't want to make that mistake. Okay. Um, also, don't forget which variables are playing what roles in the calculation. And I claim that for the purposes of the inside integral, the variables further to the outside are to be understood to be constants. So in particular, that means that for this dz integral, the x and the y are constants, and they just come along for the ride, like multiplicative constants do. right? And so uh, really what's going on here in this integral is the z antipartial of 2z 
is z squared. And the x and the y are treated as constants because they are. Okay, everything else is single variable calculus. Um, nevertheless, do make sure to wade through this. Make sure you're good. Make sure not only that you can follow this, make sure that you can do this. Right? So um, wouldn't be a bad idea to look at this until you feel comfortable with it and then uh, put it away. Um, go do something else for a couple hours so you're not just copying from you know, uh, short-term memory. And then, uh, and then write down this integral on a clean sheet of paper and make sure you crank it out. Make sure you get five. Make sure you can actually do that. Okay. Okay, here's where it gets tricky. The geometry. When you have non-rectangular domains, rectangular domains are easy, right? but non-rectangular, things get weird. Uh, it is really, again, just a rip-off of what we did with double integrals. And let me uh, go back to that point. Um, yeah, <coughs> right? For double integrals, when the domain is not a rectangle. I argued that you could just look at the picture Right, and uh, whatever is your outside variable, let's say we slice first perpendicular to the y-axis, you want to note these bounds, c to d, then fix a value of that variable, look only at that one slice, keeping in mind that that's just a picture that's kind of a sort of a... Um, <clears throat> a simplified version of this picture, when you fix y and look at that one slice, you're really just looking at what's happening in the domain concerning this area that you're trying to compute. Right? So, I mean, <coughs> yeah, I mean, that's there if you want to think about it that way, but it makes for a harder picture to draw. And as far as your bounds are concerned, all you really need to know is what's going on in the domain itself. Right, so with that in mind, again, we look at our bounds for the outside variable, in this case y. We fix that outside variable. Then we look at where that slice starts on the x-axis, and then we look at where it ends on the x-axis. And these then will be the bounds for our inside variable clearly, of course, functions of the outside variable. Right? So does everybody remember that process? Right? So you identify uh, the range of values for your outside variable, then you fix it, and then you move on to identifying the corresponding range of values for the next inside variable. So we're going to do exactly that now. Um, yeah, okay, here we go. So, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so slice perpendicular to one of your axes, identify the bounds, you know, first and last slices, and then fix a slice and repeat, right? Go back up and go through the whole process again for the next variable. All right, now I'm going to show you an example. I have this picture that I have drawn down here uh, just uh, fleshes that out for a uh, particular uh, choice of order of differentials. This was totally arbitrary. I could have done this in any order I wanted. Um, uh, so um, no particular reason. I'm doing dz, dy, dx. And with that in mind, let's uh, go through the process. Again, starting with the outside, starting with the uh, slices in the x direction. There you go. There's our range of values in the x direction. Uh, notice that uh, the slices, uh, the f slices kind of generically look like this. Those are slices perpendicular to the x-axis. Right? And there's going to be a first one, right, way in the back of my little lump of a solid here, way back in the back, the very first little point slice. And that gives me my x1, right? And then way over here in the front, uh, let's see, my picture is kind of in the way. Way over here in the front, that gives me my ending value. 
Is that good? Everybody happy? Okay, so those are our bounds. Having identified the bounds, we then now fix a value of that outside variable. So we're going to fix x, fixing x. Now we're focusing our attention then on just this one slice. And now on that slice alone, I want to consider now what happens to the next variable. Uh, the next variable, of course, is y. Okay, so I'll be looking at uh, slices perpendicular to the y-axis. Right, fine. Well, what does that look like? What's a slice perpendicular to the y-axis here? Um, eh, golly, this is going to be hard to draw. Uh, there we go. Uh, so try to use your three-dimensional imagination here. I had an x slice, so like this, right? And now I'm taking a slice perpendicular to the y-axis, sort of like this. And that slice of the slice is now just this, uh, that little thing right there. That would get rid of all of that. Sort of a sort of a little line segment, right? So now again, I got to think about first and last. Okay, so uh, the first such slice is going to be at that point right there. Uh, you know what? Let me make a better color choice. Um, that point right there, which will give me my y1. Notice it depends on x. Of course, it depends on x because the slice itself that I'm slicing up is determined by x that we've already set. Right? So that's a function of x. And then uh, likewise, the ending, the very last one of these slices of my x slice uh, will be way over there on the far right, and that'll give me my y2. So again, my bounds for my dy integral from y1 to y2. Everybody good? Let me show you where a lot of students mess this up. Lots of students <clears throat> will do the following and say, oh, okay, well, wait a second, the range of values for y, I mean, I think the smallest y value looks like it's at this point right there. I feel like there should be a point. That should be my lowest value. Uh, for the, that should be my lower y bound. And then, uh, golly, uh, probably somewhere along in here maybe is uh, the greatest uh, y value, maybe something like that. So why aren't these the bounds? And the answer is because you keep in mind, stuff that's on the inside is interested only in what's happening for a given fixed value of x. So I'm breaking the rule here. I should be confining all of my attention to the x slice. I don't want to know the absolute lowest and greatest values of y. I want to know how <laughs> the lowest and greatest values of y vary depending on the slice. Right. So this is completely uh, wrong. Uh, the, this point here is just not allowed. It's not on my x slice. Uh, this point over here, not allowed. It's not on my x slice. Now, don't worry about it. We will get to those points. Right? We'll get to them for different values of x. Uh, so, for example, um, looking at uh, you know, this point right here, when will we get to it? Well, we'll get to that when x is, uh, you know, let's say, maybe about there. And then it is part of that x slice. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. Right? Reminder, when we were doing double integrals, um, <clears throat> right. We're looking at cross-sectional areas for that particular slice of which I want to know the cross-sectional area. I need to know the starting and ending values of x on that slice because that's the thing I want to know the area of. And if uh, perhaps possibly uh, x is a little bit bigger way over here, it's got nothing to do with the air cross-sectional area I'm trying to compute. Okay, uh, so lastly, 
with X still fixed and now with Y fixed also. Right, so I want Y to be fixed, X remains fixed. Uh, <clears throat> looking at both of those variables being fixed, my slice of my slice now is just that little orange uh, segment, little strip kind of a thing. Right, and on that, I want to know the range of values of Z. And so again, you have a relatively easy picture here. Well, that point is where Z starts, and that point is where Z ends. And of course, what these start and end values of Z are, of course, is going to depend on, well, which, uh, which Y slice of my X slice am I looking at? And which X slice am I looking at? Okay, so those bounds, of course, are going to depend on X and Y. As you can see, uh, I uh, have it represented here uh, like so and like so. So that's the process. Everybody buy it? We got a bunch of examples coming up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I have in this. Um, this uh, algebra down here is just kind of uh, explicitly noting what we already talked about. Uh, the, the range of values for y, of course, are going to depend on the outside variable x, right? And as we just discussed, the range of values for z is going to depend on both of the variables further to the outside, x and y. Also, oh yeah, question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if our function f is vector value, do we just apply the triple uh, integral component wise? Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. Yeah, that we're going to do very little, if any, with that. But yes, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another reminder, just to keep in mind, uh, if I look at one of these integrals, let's say I look at the second integral. Let's look at this integral right here. Keep in mind, everything that happens in that integral is happening after I have said, oh, well, yeah, I want to know what's happening for a particular value of x. So for that entire integral, that entire blue integral, x is constant uh, for the purposes of this entire blue integral. So for example, when you uh, are cranking out this inside z integral, yes, x to be treated as a constant because it literally is. And likewise, once you get around to computing your dy integral, x treated as a constant because being further to the outside, it literally is a constant. Okay. All righty, and with that noted, uh, let's um, kind of start diving in. Um, I think we've kind of already talked about a lot of this stuff. Uh, you'll, you'll notice we constructed it outside to inside. Um, the variables further to the outside, well, I'll say the bounds of inside integrals are functions of variables further to the outside. We already talked about that. And I guess I haven't really talked about this yet, but if you want to understand particular bounds, then you're going to look at um, uh, points that define those bounds, you're going to understand them by recognizing from the picture what surfaces they're on, and those surfaces you'll understand by way of their equations. Let's, let's see that in action, uh, and here we go. Okay, uh, let me zoom a little bit more here. Okay, so we have this tetrahedron. Easy tetrahedron. Right. Zeros and ones. Very convenient. Um, I'm starting with a convenient example uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's good to get one in the win column, right? Let's uh, you know make sure that we can do this. The other thing is um, I want to emphasize the purpose. I'll see. Let me say it differently. Uh, what I want y'all to focus the most on is not what the answer turns out to be. Don't be thinking to yourselves, oh, I can persuade myself uh, that this is what the answer ought to be by other methods. What I want to do right now is make sure you understand the general process that will always allow you to get right answers. 
not this specific example, right? So, so uh, easy example, easy picture, so that we won't have distractions from the whole point of this example, which is to see the process. Okay, so here we go. Let's follow the process. Um, I am uh, choosing to slice this up um, with X on the outside. No particular reason. Doesn't matter. Arbitrary. Just for a first example, let's do that. Here's your range of values for X. Not hard to persuade yourself that X is going to start there because that's the first slice perpendicular to the X axis. And I think it's uh, pretty straightforward to argue that, that in this case it really is clear um, X is just zero there because, well, it's literally in the plane X equals zero, right? So just not much to be done there. And so that lower bound uh, is uh, X equals zero. Is that cool? Nice little easy one to start. Okay, now here, here's where we have to actually be careful. Um, let's think about the last slice, right? We've got these, um, these various triangular slices as we keep slicing perpendicular to the x-axis, and the very last one will be at this point right here. And the process, step one, once you've identified the point, next identify what are the surfaces relevant to this question that that point is on. <coughs> and I notice first that it's on that surface right there that has that equation. Picture tells me, right? Now there's four surfaces here. So it's on, this point is on some of the surfaces and it's not on the other surfaces. How do you know which one by the picture? I cannot emphasize this enough. You've got to have a reasonable picture to be able to draw the conclusions like we're doing here. So uh, next uh, surface that I can see it's on, it's uh, on that surface there. That equation is equal zero. I can also see from the picture it is on this surface there with that equation. So if I want to understand this point, what's going to give me my upper bound for the x integral I need to understand how to solve for x, because I'm looking for an x bound. I need to solve for x in this trio of equations. Everybody see how that works? Easy to solve for x, of course. Triviality, x equals 1. And that's how I got my upper bound here is 1. Now, again, I want to emphasize, I know that, yes, you can look at this thing and you can be like, oh, yeah, that's the tetrahedron. Come on, it's ones on the corners, and uh, it's just clear from the picture. Well, yeah, in this case, maybe, I suppose, but again, not the point. The point is not that we got the right answer. The point is that we see the process. This is the point that defines the bound. These are the surfaces that that point is on. Thank you, picture. <laughs> These are the equations of those surfaces, and then we solve. Okay, now with that in mind, let's move it along and do the, uh, the y bounds. Okay, so uh, we're going to fix x. So we're going to focus our attention on that arbitrary x slice. Um, <clears throat> let's see here, the y slices are going to be, uh, well, uh, sort of uh, from here to here, about like that. All right? Again, don't make the mistake of thinking that we care about that point. We don't. That's not on my x slice. I'm looking at an arbitrary general x slice, and the lower bound is here, the upper bound is there. That point's not on our slice and is not relevant. Now, if you're worried that we might not get that point at all, yeah, fear not. For a different value of x, we will, right? When x is 0, yes, we will get that point. We'll get it. Just I need to know how the y bounds depend on x. I don't need to know the, y, the overall range of values of y over the whole solid. 
Okay, so again, back to here's my x slice. Uh, the low bound for uh, for y. There's my first y slice. Pretty clearly y equals zero. It's in the plane y equals zero for crying out loud, right? Again, sometimes it's easy. Uh, let's see the last y slice will be at uh, this point. And again, we've got this problem. How are we going to understand that point? This one is not immediately obvious. Uh, so we have to think through, again, following the method. What do I know about that point? I know three things about that point. I know, for one thing, that we're on our x slice. right? We, we, we know what x is. It's the x coordinate of the x slice that we're looking at. So I like to just write down x equals x. I know it's silly. Right, uh, arguably meaningless, uh, but uh, I, it's a nice little visual reminder for me that uh, we're allowed to use x. X is known, and uh, so I'm allowed to play with it. So I like to write that down. Okay, what else do we know about that point? Well, let's see here. I know that um, according to the picture, it's in this plane right there. Thank you, picture. All right. Um, and again, from the picture, I can see the point I'm interested in is on that plane right there with that equation. So again, to find my upper bound for y, this point, in other words, I need to solve this trio of equations for y, which gives me that, which gives me that upper bound for the y in it. Everybody see the process? Questions? Is everybody happy? Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's worth repeating over and over again how important it is to have a good picture here. Uh, the picture, after all, is what tells you that this point we're interested in, uh, how do I know which, you know, Solve for y in which of these equations, right? Well, uh, I can tell which ones by the picture, and the picture is what tells me, for example, we're not in that plane. We're not in x equals 0, so you don't use that equation, right? And then likewise, we're not in this plane, so we don't use that equation. The picture is what tells us. You gotta have a picture. Um, can't be emphasized enough. But uh, last thing I'll say, I guess, uh, real quick. Uh, looks like we're relatively short on time. I got two minutes. Um, if you have trouble with three-dimensional pictures, uh, you're not alone. Drawing three-dimensional pictures does take some practice, but it also takes understanding some little clever tricks. Right, and um, I uh, gathered a lot of my little tricks for how to make you know decent three-dimensional math drawings uh, from the school of hard knocks. You know, uh, years and years and years of, uh, of doing it right and thinking it through carefully. But I also got shown some nice little handy tricks that saved me having to go through the school of hard knocks. So um, I've put everything that I know about how to draw three-dimensional math figures in a couple of uh, uh, videos that are on the YouTube channel and the Miscellaneous Topics playlist, Drawing 1 and Drawing 2. It's everything that I know about how to do good drawings and several examples, including some of the figures that we're going to be doing uh, over the next few days. If you want to know how I drew this figure here, this exact figure is one of the examples that I go through painstakingly all the little details. Uh, so uh, give that a look if you uh, would like to improve your drawing skills. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll pick up here then next time. Uh, see you all later. Have a good one.